All right. If I could have your attention, uh, I think we can get started here. Uh, so I, I want to thank you, first of all, for, for coming out tonight. I know there were many things going on this evening that could have distracted you or taken your attention, and I appreciate you coming out and sharing your evening with us. Um, I uh, would also like to uh, first tell you that um, we do participate in the CLA Passport Program. We do have stamps, and we will, of course, be stamping those at the end of the event. So by all means, come up here and get your passport stamped. We do have some passports, so if you don't have yours with you, we will be able to provide those. Uh, there will also be surveys going around. Uh, please fill out these surveys, and when you're done, hand them in to us. Um, this lecture uh, has been provided for, funded by, in part, by Charles Cork Foundation. We are extremely grateful. Uh, we would not have been able to uh, invite the caliber of lecture had we not had such funding, and he's definitely of high caliber. Um, I'd also like to tell you about an upcoming event that is happening right after spring break. Uh, Winona LaDuke will be speaking on campus as part of a center event uh, on ethics in public policy, specifically about environmentalism. Uh, that event will be occurring, uh, I believe, at 7 o'clock at Bohannon 90, so the, one of the sort of larger lecture halls on campus. There will be plenty of advertisements in the interim. Uh, Winona LaDuke is a rather large national figure who happens to be from Minnesota. I definitely encourage everybody to attend. Um, now, without sort of further ado, um, Dr. Stephen Raphael is a professor of public policy at UC Berkeley. Uh, he is the author of, well, jointly, of Why Are So Many Americans in Prison? He's also the author of um, The New Scarlet Letter, Negotiating the U.S. Labor Market with a Criminal Record. Um, and he, of course, is the editor-in-chief of Industrial Relations. Uh, and he's been a research fellow at the Minnesota, or University of Michigan National Poverty Center, the University of Chicago Crime Lab, IZA, Bonn, Germany, and the Public Poly Institute in California. Um, without further ado, uh, I'd like to get him on task. We were starting a little bit late. Uh, sure. Professor Raphael, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. Um, you know, I'm coming from Berkeley, California. I know there's a competing lecture on legalization of marijuana. I guarantee you everybody would be there if I was giving that talk in Berkeley. That's just much more the priority. So I appreciate that you're all here and that you're willing to come and, and engage with me on this topic. So uh, I've been doing a lot of work over the past, say, 10 or 15 years on, on incarceration in the United States. And uh, as you've probably learned from other, other speakers uh, in your series, the rate at which we incarcerate people in the United States is much higher than uh, any other country in the world, right? So if you, if you take people who are in prison and you add to that, and you go to prison usually if you've done something bad enough that you're going to get a sentence of a year or more, and you add to that the number of people who are sitting in a local jail, where you go to a local jail if you're awaiting trial and you can't make bail, or if you've been sentenced to something uh, relatively less severe where you're going to do under a year of time. On a per 100,000 basis, we have about 730 people per 100,000, which puts us by far the, the world's leader in incarcerating people. You can contrast this with most Western European nations, okay, where the rate hovers between 100 and 130 per 100,000. You can contrast it with Mexico, with Canada, with Russia, with China, with countries all around the world, and where many multiples, pretty much uh, all other developed uh, high income, and even many developing countries. So it's a very unusual thing. And then even if we compare our incarceration rate to our own incarceration rate in the past, if we looked at where the US was in the 1970s, we actually weren't that different from, uh, from Europe. We had about 100 per 100,000 in prisons. We had maybe another 70 per 100,000 uh, in local jails, and so we were a little bit higher. It went up, it went down, as crime rates went up and down, but we didn't necessarily have kind of the, the sort of monster prison populations that we have today. Now, a lot of my work uh, over the, the past uh, 10 years or so has been devoted to trying to understand why that happened. And when you, you look into the various determinants, basically a few things stand out, and that is A, we've changed our sentencing policy in a manner that 
that we apply prison more frequently, or, or to use the language that an economist would use, I'm an economist, we apply prison on the extensive margin uh, with, with greater frequency. In other words, uh, we, you know, conditional on being convicted of a crime, your likelihood of going to prison has increased. But in, in addition to punishing, to using prison more extensively, we also use it more intensively, right? In that we send people away with longer sentences. We have, have sort of gummed up the process of letting people out of prison uh, subject to parole board review. And what's end up happening is the amount of time that someone can expect to serve, conditional on their criminal history record and conditional on, on what they've done, has gone up quite a bit over the last 20 years. And pretty much these policy changes explain entirely, uh, entirely the growth, right? And explains how we got to where we are. Now, of course, we're in a period of, of retrenchment to some degree. There's efforts uh, underway in many states uh, and also in the federal government to sort of scale back the use of prisons. And it's it's interesting thing to note that most of that activity in terms of the policy arena really happens at the state level, right? Because we don't have a prison system. We have 51 prison systems in this country with each state having its own penal code and the federal government having its own penal code. And it's the combined uh, behavior of those 50 states that essentially determines our incarceration rate. And what we're seeing is that in many states, uh, and in some pretty high incarceration traditional users of prison, like Texas, California, Louisiana, Kentucky, there are concerted policy efforts to bring down the prison population, right, to sort of reverse some of, of the growth that's happened, and a lot of concentration focused on the growth that's happened since the 1990s. Now, of course, this issue of how do you bring back prison or how do you bring down prison raises issues about public safety, okay? So if we think about what prison, why we use prisons in the first place, right, we can think about re re retributive sort of motivations for incarcerating people. So we're mad at somebody, we want to punish them, we put them away. But aside from retribution, we also use corrections and prisons as a crime control device, right? And we can think of several reasons why such a punishment might control crime. If you face a stiff punishment for, for, for violating society's norms, perhaps you're less likely to commit that crime in the first place, all right? Or that's what a, what a criminologist would refer to general deterrence, right? That the threat of the punishment will lower crime below, uh, below what it otherwise would be. But at the same time, to the extent that people are heterogeneous with respect to their propensity to commit crime, people who are revealing themselves to the criminal justice system and being punished and being removed from society to a certain degree are being incapacitated, right? So if they're behind bars, they can't, they can't commit crimes in non-institutional society, and we'd expect that to have an impact on, on local crime rates. And so one, now, of course, there are other ways that incarceration can impact crime, right? So there's evidence that the experience of doing time, right, that actually uh, serving time in a prison or serving time in a juvenile justice system, for some people is actually what criminologists call criminogenic, right, in the sense that they come out more criminally prone than when they went in, largely because of the, of the conditions of brutality that oftentimes exist in many prisons and jails, but also because, frankly, their, their skills tend to erode when they're taken out of society. They acculturate to a different set of norms and, and adapt to a different set of circumstances. And those circumstances, while rational adaptations while you're incarcerated, may not be rational adaptations in the non-institutionalized world, and hence we have very high recidivism among people that are, that are incarcerated. So what we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna look at essentially prison as a crime control device, right? And what, what I'm gonna argue is that, that indeed there's quite a bit of empirical evidence that suggests that prison can be an effective crime control device, which then raises the question of if we're gonna reduce our incarceration rate, how are we gonna do this in a way that doesn't, doesn't jeopardize public safety? But what I'm also gonna argue is that the United States has pushed its prison population to such an extent right, along that extensive and intensive margin, something we're gonna mention a few times over the course of this talk, that the, the sort of benefits in terms of crime prevention of, uh, of putting people away have actually diminished to quite low levels. And I'm gonna pr provide some, some case study evidence where we see prison present, preventing a lot of crime and case study evidence where prison doesn't prevent a lot of crime. So that's what we're gonna do, okay? And then in the process, we'll also talk about uh, a, lot of, a lot of policy action that's occurring uh, at, the, at the state level, and then maybe think about what's the room for reducing prison and what we would have to do to both maintain public safety but not have such a, a, a socially costly uh, criminal justice response, okay?
So I, I want to start with a couple of contrasting case studies, okay, to show a, a, a few different, um, to show uh, kind of, to, to show a contrast, I think, that, that is, is quite interesting. So Italy has this very interesting tradition, right? So for the last hundred years or so, periodically, the Italian government will pass collective clemency bills whereby they will essentially let out a lot of people into their local prison. Okay, sometimes it's prompted by overcrowding in the prisons, sometimes it's prompted by religious considerations. So for example, the, recent, uh, the most recent Collective Clemency Act was something that was campaigned for by Pope John Paul. But they happen periodically and they're sudden, and not only they're sudden, they're discreet, right, in that they actually cause large changes in the prison population. So the most recent version of this was passed on July 1st, 2006. And basically what the, what the Collective Clemency Bill in Italy did was it led to an immediate release of about one third of the prison population on August 1st, 2006. So they passed a bill that said, anybody who committed a crime, was convicted of a crime before May 2nd of that year, has their sentence reduced by three years. And there were a few exceptions, right? So if you were involved in, in sexual assault, terrorism, kidnapping, exploiting a prostitute, right? Or if you were um, uh, uh, a mafiosa, it didn't apply to you. Um, there's no post-release supervision, right? So there's no parole officer or probation officer. And the only sort of catch was if you were pardoned inmate, if you got this collective clemency, you got caught doing something else, whatever remaining time you had on your sentence was tagged onto your next sentence. That was the, the one catch. So what happened in this collective clemency? Well, basically, this is, uh-oh, there we go. I don't think there's a laser pointer. There's no laser pointer in this? In the middle. Oh, in the middle. Aha, uh -huh. okay. This is the Italian incarceration rate by month. And what we're measuring here is the monthly incar the number of people in prison per 100,000 uh, Italian residents. This is the month relative to August 2006 when the collective clemency uh, goes into effect. And basically what you see when you hit zero, that's basically July, August 2006, is that the prison population is hovering at a, between 90 and 100 per 100,000. And then literally from one month to the next, the prison population drops down to 60 per 100,000. And then since their sentencing practices actually don't change, over the subsequent five years, it returns back up to where it was. And it's basically now, uh, after all is said and done, where it, was, uh, where it was in 2006. So if we did this, and if prison actually incapacitates people uh, from, from committing crime, what we might expect is that there would be a corresponding impact on, on criminal incidents in, in Italy that match in timing with uh, this change in incarceration. And the one thing I'm going to point out to you is just notice the level here, right? So in Italy, we're talking about an incarceration rate of about 100 per 100,000. So it's about one-seventh the incarceration rate of the United States. So this is basically a picture of monthly serious felony crime in, in, in the country. This is before, this is after. And what you can basically see is that if you fit sort of a smooth line on either side of this break, there appears to actually be a quite sizable increase in crime with the shift in policy, right? And not only that, if we go back, as the incarceration rate rises back to its level, okay, you actually see the crime rate declining, uh, declining in tandem. And what you can do, or what criminologists do, is they try to actually estimate, okay, well, per prison year served, how much crime is being prevented, or in this instance, created by the prison year not being served. And we have a few different estimates here, right? So if we just look at this increase in crime over here, and we compare that to the reduction in the prison population, basically what we see is that each prison year not served was preventing about 18 crimes uh, per person, or 18 crimes um, uh, per person. So it actually had a fairly substantial effect on criminal incidents, right? And so, the, the, and that's, that's, this is not news in Italy, right? So Italy has done this many times. It's actually amazing to show sort of cross-country cross differences as an institution. In Italy, they were happening so frequently that in the early 1990s, they passed a supermajority requirement to have another prison release, right? That you had to have three thir two thirds the vote of parliament to actually have another. So here we can't reduce population. Everybody votes to put people away. And for whatever reason, collective clemencies have, been, have occurred with relative frequency that they actually built institutions into their uh, parliamentary procedures to prevent them from happening. Okay, so that's what happens in Italy, and basically the basic story is that, you know, we have a big drop in prison, we have a big increase, uh, we have a big increase in crime. 
Now let's fast forward, or not fast forward, we'll move to the other side of the world and we're going to look at what's happening in California, right, where we have another sort of very similar uh, large-scale uh, decline in the incarceration rate that's driven, again, by policy. So California has a very uh, large prison system. We have, perhaps, the, uh, aside from the feds, we have the largest prison system in the country, okay, in terms of the number of inmates, the number of institutions, and uh, not necessarily per capita, but in terms of the total system. And we sort of went through uh, the same kind of policy reforms that most of, of the country did. We expanded our sentencing. We introduced repeat offender laws that were um, uh, handing down pretty severe sentences uh, for people who were convicted sometimes of relatively less serious crimes if it was their second or third offense. And we also had a series of mandatory minimums that led to big growth in the prison population. And essentially what happened was that the growth in the prison population didn't keep uh, uh, track or, or outpaced the growth in the capacity of the system. And by the early 1990s, we basically started to have populations relative to bed capacity that were 130%, then 140%, and all the way up to 200%, where the prison system became extremely overcrowded. Okay? Now, once this happened, not surprisingly, in prisons that are overcrowded, lots of bad things occur, right? So most of, most of the space that would be used for programming is devoted to housing people. It becomes very difficult to sort of maintain uh, yards when there are so many people, so there's going to be a lot of out, outbreaks, there's a lot of fighting. Yards go on lockdown a lot where people can't leave their cells and so on and so forth. And it also siphons resources away from other things such as health care uh, and mental health care. And what ended up happening was there were several lawsuits that were brought by legal advocates on behalf of prison inmates in California that were claiming that essentially the overcrowding of the system was leading to unconstitutional conditions in the system whereby people were not uh, receiving adequate health care. And there were a couple of different lawsuits, Coleman versus Brown and Plata versus Brown, which were combined uh, into one lawsuit that was overseen by a federal three-judge panel, where the federal courts basically ordered California to either build more capacity or reduce its prison population to 137% of, of its rated capacity. The state fought it, appealed it several times, went all the way to the Supreme Court, and basically in 2011, the Supreme Court upheld uh, the lower court's decision that California had to comply with the population cap. And so California had to do something. And what did the state do? Well, basically the state passed a reform called realignment that basically limited the ability of returning people to prison for a technical parole violation, in other words, for missing an appointment or having a dirty drug test or doing something that is, that is sort of short of felonious. And it also defined a new group of offenders that they call triple non-offenders, so non-serious, non-sexual, non-violent with no evidence of, of crimes of that, uh, that uh, uh, nature in their criminal histories and diverted those offenders to, uh, to local jail and to community corrections rather than prison, okay? And what happened, okay? So basically, if we look at admissions to the state prison system, I keep doing that, sorry. If we look at admissions to the state prison system, weekly admissions before this reform in California hovered at around 2,000 per week, okay? Once the reform goes into effect, it drops to about 500 per week, and essentially what's happening is you know, people are constantly churning in and out of prison at various times. Every week, 2,000 are being released, 2,000 people are being admitted. If you drop admissions and it holds constant, eventually releases drop to that lower level. And if admissions are falling short of releases, then the insti institutional population shrinks. And that's exactly what happened in California, right? So you see we had 160,000 some odd people, and then it dropped to about 120, uh, it dropped to about 120,000 or 135,000, I think, after the form was over. Interestingly, there was another reform that basically turned a bunch of, of what were then low-level uh, drug crimes and property crimes uh, into misdemeanors from felonies, and if we were to extend this out about another year, there'd be another big drop, right? Okay, so what this does, as a researcher, I get all excited when I see a big drop, right? Because that means it's something else you can evaluate or we can investigate whether what happened in Italy also happens in California, okay? And so this is just kind of, the interesting thing about uh, California is the, the state has 58 counties. Some of the counties are very conservative, experienced very big declines in their prison population. Some are very uh, liberal, experienced very little declines in the prison population because they weren't using prison that frequently. 
And so what this is doing is it's just comparing changes before and after in crime rates against changes in the county-specific incarceration rate for different time periods, and this is for violent crime, and this is for property crime. And what you can see is there doesn't appear to be much of a relationship in this data, right? That the, the counties that received a lot of inmates as a result of this reform didn't have a crime rate, whether it was property crime or violent crime. And we can look at that a different way, right? So for example, here's crime rates in California. California is the orange <coughs> line, okay? And here's a set of comparison states that when you average them look like California. The reform takes place right here, and you basically see no increase in violent crime in the state. If we look at property crime, you do see a little bit of an increase in property crime associated with uh, releasing so many people from prison, but it's relatively small. And if we were to do a comparable metric to what we did in Italy, Basically what we found in, in evaluating what happened in California is that roughly you had about an additional one criminal incident per year not served, and it was all concentrated on auto theft, right? And the interesting thing about auto theft is people who engage in motor vehicle theft are very productive, right? It, it, tur it turns out to be in terms of like criminal activity, the most skilled of criminal activities, right? Because you got to know how to steal a car, and then you have to have the social capital to actually move the car. Right? You have to know where the car could be sort of broken down and the parts can be sold. And so the fact that we had a small effect probably had something to do with relatively few people who were stealing a lot of cars, but it also meant that most of the inmates who were on the street instead of in prison basically were not adding to crime totals in, in California. Now what's interesting is this reduction okay, in California actually reduced the prison population back to what it was in 1990. So it, it erased almost 15 years of growth, and it brought the state to its pre-three strikes levels, right? So it's essentially literally reduced mass incarceration in the state relative to where we were in the 70s and 80s by a substantial amount, right? And, it, and, and no crime wave resulted. And so it's an interesting contrast. We have Italy, right, where there's big release. We have a spike in crime. We have California, big release. We don't have anything in crime. So what's going on? Why are these two things different, okay? Well, the, there, there are several different things that we can use to explain that difference, right? So one possibility might simply be that Italy and California are different places, and they're clearly different places, right? Have you ever been to Italy? Have you ever been to California? They don't speak the same language, right? They look different, okay? One drive around little Vespas, okay? The other been in a car. So they're very, they're very, very different places, right? And that might explain the difference. However, there's one glaring difference between Italy and California, okay? And that is that in Italy, the incarceration rate per per 100,000 people is roughly about 100 when they reduced uh, the, um, when they reduced, uh, when they introduced this reform. In California, the incarceration rate inclusive of jails, which is what we'd be comparing it to if we compared Italy, because in Italy, the pretrial population and the sentence population are all in the state prison system. Basically, what our rate was around 700 per 100,000, right? So we had seven times the rate. And the question that, that we're going to sort of be looking at in some detail is, is it that? Is that what essentially is des describing the difference? Okay? Is it the case that, uh, to use the language of economics, that perhaps there's diminishing returns to scale? Or that as we expand the use of incarceration on the margin, its effectiveness as a crime control device diminishes? Right? And that's, that's what I'm going to propose is essentially uh, what's going on here. Okay? Now, why would this be the case? Why would we expect diminishing returns to scale? Well, if we think about how we started this lecture, okay, I was talking about what led to the increase in prison. I said, well, we use it more extensively. We apply it to more people who get into trouble, right? So we're, we're sort of expanding the net of who we apply incarceration to, okay? When we expand the net, we're going to catch smaller fish, right? And so one of the things that essentially might have happened is that by applying incarceration more liberally, and I mean liberally as to more people, not in a liberal manner, politically speaking, we're basically netting people on average who are less, who are less criminally prone, and we're depriving uh, them of their personal liberty and punishing them in a very severe way and not getting much uh, benefit for it in a consequentialist uh, manner of thinking in terms of crime prevention. So we know that you know, and you can just take that thought experiment to the extreme, right? So it's most people are not committing sort of felonious crime on a regular basis, right? And you know that if you were to increase the incarceration rate to 10%, 20%, 30% of the population, sooner or later you're going to have a lot of people who are doing time who don't need to be there, right? Now it turns out 
that there's evidence that those diminishing returns can actually set in at relatively low levels, right? And, and part of, I think, what's going on is that essentially we're, we're expanding the net and we're netting people who are less dangerous, and that's what, what uh, explains the difference between the two. Now, of course, the other possibility is that when we expand incarceration by using it more intensively, by sending people away for, for longer periods of time, right? We're also netting people into years of their life course where they're less likely to be committing crime anyway, right? So if we think about the natural, I mean, one of the, one of the sort of, you know, most robust empirical regularities in empirical criminology is that people's propensity to offend increases when you're kind of your age, right, until you're about 25, until your brains are fully developed, you guys are totally out of control, okay, you're really smart but impulsive, okay, but then post-25, it declines quite rapidly, even for people who are actually quite highly criminally prone. And so when you send somebody away for a long period, when you send for 30 years instead of 20 years, that additional 10 years buys you very little, okay, in terms of crime control, right? But it can actually add quite a bit to the incarceration rate to the extent that you're sending lots of people away for an extra 10 years, right? And so that's, that's the other possibility. And so what I wanna do is to show you a little bit of data that, that might speak to this from within the prison, okay, so from within the, the, the California state prison system. So a few years ago, I was part of a, a, of a panel where we were asked to, to do some projects analyzing inmate misconduct in, inside the state prison system. And it's, it's quite interesting, actually, all prison systems have their own sort of internal system for evaluating inmate behavior, sometimes that felonious behavior in a system of, of uh, kind of adjudication, punishment, and uh, uh, sanctions for people who, who engage in behavior. And we were asked to come in and analyze essentially how it varied across the different security levels. We have high security, low security, and what are the determinants of essentially uh, inmate misconduct. And the way California breaks things down is they break them into these categories, A1, A2, B, C, D, E, F. A1, A2 is very serious, like murdering another inmate. B, C, D is less serious. It could be getting into a fight or being caught with contraband. EF uh, is even less serious, so it could be willful, uh, willful disobeying or drugs or making a, I can't remember what the name of the prison hooch is that they call, but they make a drug called, I don't know, they make a, a sort of prison alcohol that will get you an EF. And this is, and these are all things that you can be written up for and they're violations, right? There's basically like breaking the prison rules and you can think about it as almost like institutionally defined crime, okay? Now, what you see is among inmates, most inmates actually over any given period of a year are actually pretty well behaved, right? So only 1.9 are, are catching an A1A2 serious rules violation. For the less serious ones, it's about 12 or 15 percent. And overall, you have about 25 percent of inmates in California that are doing something that gets them in trouble in prison, meaning that three quarters are not doing anything that gets them in trouble in prison, right? So if we look within the prison system, among people who are convicted of committing crime, you actually see quite a bit of heterogeneity in terms of their compliance with rules and in terms of their behavior behind bars. And one would think that that would naturally translate into difference into compliance with community corrections or the propensity to reoffend if they're if they're then released into the community. And in fact, it does. It's predictive. The other thing we can do is we can look at essentially how this inmate misconduct. So this this is kind of the extensive margin story, right? That we have some inmates that are getting into a lot of trouble and some inmates that are not, right? We can also look along the extensive margin. We can ask, well, what happens as people age? Right? So are, are we seeing that within prison, among people who are all convicted felons, do we see that as they age, the likelihood that they get a serious rules violation behind bars goes down? And, if, and essentially, this is what this is doing. So, oh, sorry. Here's their, you know, any violation. This is the very serious violations. Here's B, C, D, E, F. And it's just showing what the average violation rate is as a function of age. And what you can see is that, you know, here's the kind of crazy 20s over here, right? And then as people get older, right, their propensity to, uh, to get in trouble declines uh, quite precipitously, right? So even among people that are, are, are sort of, you know, punished with the most severe sanctions, you see sort of evidence of, uh, uh, of kind of 
diminishing criminality with age, and also heterogeneity in the propensity to get in trouble in very, uh, in, in very highly criminogenic um, uh, circumstances. Because prisons sometimes, sometimes there are situations that arise where people get into trouble and it's not, uh, it's, it's frankly not really of their choosing, right? Okay. So, uh, so that's, that's sort of some evidence, right? We can look in California, we can see kind of this heterogeneity. Um, we can see this heterogeneity in, uh, in um, we can see this heterogeneity in the propensity to offend as well as in, um, as well as in the propensity to offend with age. Now, the other thing that's quite interesting is we can, let's revisit our story with Italy, right? So Italy, we had mentioned, we have a big exogenous shock associated with the Italian collective clemency. We have a big increase in crime. Right? And so the story is, okay, well, that, that was probably not a good idea. Right? And in fact, that's, that's that is how it played out in the Italian press. And it's one of the reasons why the Italians have become much more uh, reticent to engage in, in mass releases at any given time. Okay? But we can, still, we can still look at heterogeneity in, in Italy. Right? So we know Italy doesn't have counties. Italy has provinces. And they have roughly about 100 provinces. And the provinces vary quite a bit with respect to their use of incarceration. Right? There are some pro provinces that use it quite a bit. And there are some provinces that don't use it. And it correlates with politics. And it correlates with the beliefs of judges. And it cor correlates with local practices the same way it does in the United States. So one of the things we can do is we can ask, well, let's compare those provinces that had high incarceration rates and ask what the effect of the collective clemency was on those that are using it a lot to provinces that have low incarceration rates and uh, are using it sparingly. Do we see that essentially those provinces that have high incarceration rates have lesser effects on crime? And in fact, that's kind of what we see, right? So for example, <coughs> We had I had mentioned at the very beginning that what we had found was that on average, each prison year not served as a result of the collective clemency resulted in 15 additional felony offenses. If we look at the provinces that had below median incarceration rates, in other words, the provinces that use uh, prison sparingly, the effect is 36, 36 crimes. If we looked at the effect of provinces that have high incarceration or that have low high incarceration rates and I'll, I'll say what that means in a minute it's only four crimes right so the effect is much smaller and the interesting thing is, is to, to sort of point out is what is the difference between a high and low incarceration rate province in, in Italy okay so this is looking at at the percentiles of the distribution of incarceration rates so in other words this value here 32.5 10% of the provinces have an incarceration rate at that level or lower. 25% of the incarceration rates have, or of the provinces have an incarceration rate at that level or lower, and so on and so forth. So the, the, the toughest province, or the near toughest, the province at the 90th percentile, in other words, they incarcerate more than 90% of the other provinces, their rate is only 191.9 per 100,000, okay? Which is essentially lower than the incarceration rate of San Francisco, right? Which is an incredibly liberal city. Right? And, and uses incarceration rate very sparingly. And it's certainly much lower than, say, uh, Kings County in California. There's an incarceration rate of 1,100 per 100,000, not including the jail population. Right? So the variation we're seeing across this European country is very small. Right? It's, it's, it's almost like it doesn't even overlap with us okay? in, terms of, in terms of the policy heterogeneity. And what's fascinating is what we see here okay? is for these high incarceration rate counties, or these high incarceration rate provinces, excuse me, the effects on crime are very small. Okay, so the blue bars are showing essentially the effects on crime, right? So again, if we go back to this contrast, again, in California, right, we incarcerate people at the 650 to 700 per 100,000 level. We have a big shock to incarceration. We don't see much of an effect on crime. In Italy, right, they, they, they have a similar shock. They had a big effect. But Italy's country hovers around here, and California is going to be over here, right? So we're not, we're not even comparable, right? And the, the sort of point to walk away with here is that even in a low incarceration rate setting, in a European setting, what we see is that as we start increasing the use of this, of this particular crime control device, its effectiveness diminishes quite rapidly at levels that are much lower than us. If we could reduce our incarceration rate, for example, the movement to reduce by half, right, would bring us to roughly 350 per 100,000. It would still be, you know, one and a half times what the high incarceration rate in, 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 uh, in, a, in, um, in uh, 
in, in this high incarceration rate Italian provinces, okay? We can do another example from Europe, okay, where, where, uh, um, where we can find uh, sort of further evidence, so to speak, of, uh, of diminishing marginal returns. And th this is actually another kind of interesting for, for people who are interested in criminal justice reform. It's just a surprising contrast between the way things are done in other countries and sometimes the way things, uh, or, or just a, uh, an interesting case study in how different, right, other, other approaches to policy can be. Not necessarily better or worse, but, but drastically different. Okay, so uh, there's a, a well-known study um, by, uh, by a, a, an economist slash uh, criminology researcher in, uh, in the Netherlands named Ben Villard that essentially analyzes a sentencing enhancement uh, policy change in uh, Holland in 2001. And basically what the Dutch did is the Dutch passed a sentence enhancement that targeted offenders who had 10 or more felony offenses, right? So in other words, they already had 10 felony convictions. And if you got caught this 11th time, well, now we really mean it, right? That's basically what they did. And so what, what was the sentence enhancement? So basically what they were gonna do is they increased the sentence from two months to two years, okay? For your 11th felony, right? And that was, uh, that was the mandatory minimum um, in the Netherlands. No, note in, in California, that third offense gets you a life sentence, right? So you can kind of just do the, the contrast between, uh, between the two nations. Now the interesting thing about this particular, uh, the way this rolled out in the Netherlands is the different sort of municipalities, okay, in the Netherlands were actually allotted a number of uh, slots that they can use for this sentence enhancement. Where some cities, uh, Dutch cities, were actually given uh, a, number of, a number of opportunities to apply the sentence enhancement, which was large relative to their population of quote unquote usual suspects, and other cities, right, were given allotment which was small relative to their population of high-flying frequent offenders, right? And so what ended up happening is you were able to look at the different cities and see those, those cities who were able to dip more deeply into their uh, highly criminally active suspect pool and compare them to the cities who were less able to dig into their highly criminally active pool and essentially contrast, right? How serious, how much more serious were those offenders and what were the effect of putting those people away on serious felony offenses uh, in Holland, right? And so essentially this picture is kind of summarizing what this study shows. So what, what Villard does is he constructs something called an incapacitation ratio, okay? which basically measures the proportion of your usual suspects, in other words, your, your stock of local guys who have 10 or more felony offenses, that you'll be able to apply this sentence to if they were to commit an 11th offense. And what you can see is that the cities varied quite a bit, right, with some, you know, not having that many allocated to them relative to their pool, and others having enough to apply it to 40% of the pool. And what Villard does is he just says, well, let's look at their criminal history and ask, right, how serious are they, these guys in terms of the annual number of offenses that, that these guys are, are committing on average? And what you can see is those areas that are able to dip deeper into their pool of offenders are capturing guys that are essentially committing less crime on average by about half than places where it's done, uh, done uh, where they have to use it more sparingly. Again, this is a, 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 a sort of national setting where the incarceration rate is low, right, on the order of 120 per 100,000, so a fraction of what it is, uh, not a fraction, but a, you know, a fifth of what it is or a sixth of what it is in the United States, right? And again, even at these very low levels, you see evidence of diminishing returns, okay? Now, aside from that, oh, what do, do we want to go to Israel? Oh, yeah, let's, let's do one more international result. Right? So I'm, I'm going to talk about one other, other interesting thing uh, that I think actually points to a, um, a policy reform that many people in the United States advocate for. And in particular, we're going to look at, at a sort of policy reform that occurred in Israel, okay? where actually Israel expanded the use of its state jails kind of by accident. Okay? So, so basically, uh, um, in, uh, in Within the last decade, there was a reform in Israel with regards to who would manage the prison authority. And what happened was before, sort of prisons were, or the, the sort of local jail was maintained by the local police, okay? And essentially the police had it as part of their budget that they had to cover the expenses of keeping people in jail. 
And it's, there was a reform that realigned responsibility of the local jail from the police to the National Prison Authority. So essentially, it, you know, any additional person that somebody arrested and then booked and admitted to jail no longer came out of the police budget. It came out of a different agency's budget, right? And so what would you expect to happen okay, if the police are sensitive to their budget needs when that reform takes place? What do you think will happen? I'll just show you what happens. Okay, so, so basically what happens okay, is they start arresting and incarcerating more people. Right? So here's essentially the weeks from the reform. Okay? These are the number of incarcerated arrestees each week. Okay? All of a sudden the police aren't footing the bill. Okay? And the number of arrestees that are being uh, put into the local jail goes up actually quite drastically in a relatively short uh, period of time. Which is kind of an interesting thing. Right? It's it sort of, you know, as an economist, it, it suggests how important incentives are in systems for determining some of these aggregate outcomes, right? You can alter the cost incentive slightly, and it could actually lead to a big change, uh, a big change in practice in the criminal justice system, and in any system for that matter, right? And you find evidence of that in Israel, okay? So what happens? Well, basically, if we compare people who are arrested before and after the reforms and people who are incarcerated before and after the, after, after the reforms, you first see something very interesting, right, is that of the people who are arrested and brought to the jail and booked, there's a big drop in the percent that are actually charged with a crime, right? And it, what the researchers basically argue is that that's evidence of a decline in the average probable cause of the arrest that they're making, right? That they're probably arresting people for whom they did not have the grounds to arrest them because the, the equivalent of the district attorney is deciding not to charge the person, okay? The other thing that they do is they look at the people who are arrested and charged and they say, okay, what's the maximum possible sentence these guys can get before and after the reform? And what they find is despite the fact that it, you know, it's not a particularly large increase in arrests relative to uh, the volume of things in the United States, but you see a di discrete decline in the average severity of essentially what people are doing okay, uh, after the reform relative to before the reform, because this expansion along the extensive margin okay, is basically netting less serious, uh, less, letting less serious offenders. Okay? And then the, other, the final sort of uh, finding from the study is, again, you find evidence that, that the sort of marginal effectiveness of an arrest is lower after the reform than before the reform as it's applied more liberally. Right? So, it, so in other words, um, all of these things, right, you have evidence within the United, we have evidence from California, which is a case study. You also have evidence within, uh, within Italy and within the Netherlands and with, within Israel that suggests that you don't have to dig too deep into the criminal uh, population to, to start be, uh, to hit a point where the marginal returns are, are low, okay? And then just as a, as a final empirical uh, fact, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up, what I want to do is just sort of show you what the incarceration rate on average is in the United States for different points in time. So if we compare what it is in 1977 through 1988, not including the jail population, it's roughly 171 per 100,000, 89 to 99, 349, 2000, 2000, 449, right? So we're way beyond what's happening in the, in the Netherlands, what's happening in Israel, what's happening in, uh, in Italy. And in terms of, if we can think of there being sort of a return incarceration rate curve, we're probably pretty far down the road in terms of, uh, in terms of marginal rates. Now it turns out that there's actually a lot of research on the United States that analyzes the effectiveness as a pr of prison as a crime control device as we move through this path. And what that research tends to show is pretty much exactly what we've been talking about, both for California and for these other places, right? That essentially, marginal increases in incarceration from 1990 on seem to have been relatively ineffective, right, in, in combating crime. Uh, and, uh, um, and certainly in the 2000s, they've been particularly ineffective. In fact, there's not much evidence of any impact whatsoever. Now, on the other hand, they actually might be counterproductive, right, to the extent that a high level of incarceration corresponds to a large sort of pool of people who were formerly incarcerated, right, and they have minimum uh, sort of diminished labor market uh, um, opportunities and perhaps uh, enhanced criminality as a result of having served time, it could be the case that, you know, we could hit points where actually incarcerating people can become counterproductive, right, it can actually contribute to crime overall and there's some evidence that that takes place, okay?
Okay, so let's have uh, just some some uh, some concluding thoughts, uh, and then then we can you know take questions. So um, I'm I'm personally pretty convinced. Okay, I, I I suspected it to be true, but I'm more convinced after after California's uh, recent experience that we have much more room in this country for selective incapacitation, or or in other words, for more sparing use of prison. And if done right, it doesn't necessarily have to result in uh, doesn't necessarily have to result in more crime. I think that's especially true, okay, in the states that have very very high incarceration rates throughout the South, for example. And it's especially true uh, if the uh, the policy lever that we were to pull to reduce incarceration would be sort of taking some of the edge off very long mandatory minimums where we're incarcerating people uh, into into advanced age. As I had mentioned, there is a, a sort of interesting uh, policy uh, debate that's sort of unfolding in my home state, and that's that after that shock, we had another shock that was almost of equal magnitude, and the jury's out. It could be the case that this last shock led to an increase in crime, you know, and, and so we'll have to see. So it's something that we're monitoring, and it's something that, that, peop that both criminal justice agencies and researchers are sort of investigating on, on, a, on a regular basis. There are other ways to think about whether, you know, I mean, it just, I think it's worthwhile just to muse a little bit about what might be an optimal level, right? So clearly, you know, what, what, what all of these results have shown is that, you know, if you push the incarceration rate too low, there are, you can get to a point where, you know, that one person, the decision on whether or not to incarcerate the person can actually prevent a lot of crime and clearly can prevent some very serious crime, right? So nobody wants to be visited by a violent encounter uh, and, and that's something that we have to take seriously. And it, it raises the issue of, you know, what is the optimal rate? So, you know, is it 100 per 100,000? Is it 200 per 100,000? Is it 300 per 100,000? And that's a hard question to ask, right? In some ways, it requires that you articulate, right, what, what an economist would call a social welfare function, but I think a normal person would require, call an objective, right? So what are you trying to achieve with, with incarceration? If you're trying to minimize crime, Okay, then you have to compare both the costs, not only in terms of the expenditures, but also the social costs in terms of collateral impacts on families, uh, the impacts on, on inmates themselves when they get out and they're no longer inmates, right? And all of the other sort of indirect ways that, that mass incarceration impacts society to the benefits in terms of crime. And you have to put numbers on them and you gotta come, uh, you gotta come, to, uh, you gotta come to a decision. Alternatively, if, if one were to read, and it's, it's worth reading, the recent, recent National Academy of Sciences uh, uh, panel study on mass incarceration, they take a different tack. Rather than framing things in terms of benefits and costs, they frame things in terms of, in basically in terms of ethics, right? So what, what is, uh, you, know, they, you know, what is a proportional punishment for a crime, right? What is our, our, what is our duty to one another as common citizens uh, uh, um, uh, in terms of, of defining what's optimal and what's not optimal? And so it's important to think through these issues of, of you know, where we want to go and, and what we, uh, we want to do. I think, however, it's pretty safe to say that the unprecedented use of incarceration that, uh, that we've seen in the United States over the last, uh, over the last decade or so um, by most uh, objective functions um, uh, are basically, is basically excessive, right, and can't, can't be justified. Okay, that's it. All right, so I'm happy to get Sure, yeah, yeah, go ahead. And the surveys are coming around, so please pull those out. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I'll repeat it so everybody can hear. So the question is that if we have so many people in prison, eventually so many people come back, and what does that do to our communities, and what do we have to do for them? 
And one of the interesting kind of little known facts about the way prison systems work you know, in this country is, is we think we put people away and we lock them up, we throw away the key, and then eventually they come back and we have to deal with it. What actually happens is something a little different. And that is about every year we release about half and every year we admit about half, right? With some people staying a lot longer, some people getting shorter. So the reentry issue is a constant problem. You know, it's, there, there are people on the order of 750,000 prison inmates per year being released in the United States and an equal number going in. And that's why it, that's why it stays where it is. So that reentry challenge is something that has been ongoing for since you know it existed in the 1970s when our incarceration rate was low and it's just magnified with uh with with the growth and growth in incarceration it impacts our communities already right now in terms of what what we need to do for people the other thing we know is that when when people are released actually the 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 failure rate however it is you want to define it the recidivism rate is actually pretty high so um in in my home state before this reform within three years, 70% were back in prison. Okay, a lot of times it was for, for technical violations, not for a new felony offense, but the, you know, the, the, the inmates in California sometimes refer to this as doing life on, on, on an installment plan, right? In that they'll be released, they'll be out for six months, they'll be in for three months, they'll be out for six months, in for eight months, and so on and so forth. And people can cycle in and out of prison seven or eight times over the course of their 20s and early 30s. What do we need to do? Uh, well, we need a lot of things, okay? So, so number one, right, many people uh, sort of come out of prison without just the basic fundamentals like ID, okay, a place to live, uh, um, uh, sort of connecting with their family, uh, trying to find a job and so on and so forth. Everything that most functional adults have in the U.S., many people come out of prison without that, right? That they're given a little bit of gate money and then they're sent on their way. Right Now, there are efforts, some states are better than others, and some states have more robust reentry programs, and some communities have more robust reentry efforts. So places that tend to have more kind of local activism tend to do a better job of, of integrating offenders. But for the most part, given how decentralized our criminal justice system is, we tend to underinvest in re in, in reentry, and we have a high failure rate. Any other questions? Uh huh. Yeah, yes, people have studied. So the question is, is, is there studies of, of how, uh, how much it costs to sort of succe uh, a successful reentry program versus putting someone away? Um, it turns out that putting someone away varies quite a bit across states. So, you know, in Alabama, it could be, you know, in the, in the mid to low teens, okay, per year. In California, it's upwards of around $70,000 per year, okay? And, and for the most part, the cost uh, differentials has most to do with uh, the, the salary structure of who's running the prison, right? So we have a, um, a, a fairly large wage bill in the California prison systems, and some other prison uh, systems, it's relatively low. So it costs a lot of money. On average across the country, the, the estimate of the average cost per inmate year is about $35,000. $35, um, there are some successful reentry programs, for example, you know, little things like cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, transitional jobs, drug treatment, getting people, uh, getting people their IDs, and having some intensive case management in those first, say, eight weeks out when the failure rate is the highest tends to actually be a lot cheaper than putting somebody, putting somebody away. And if you can prevent a crime in the process as well, then it can be a whole hell of a lot cheaper, okay, once you take into account some of the, the social costs associated with the victimization. 
So yes, investing money uh, as people are coming out is, is usually a, a good thing. Yes. They are. Yeah. Incarceration rates are on the high. Uh-huh. And you, you, you think these aren't correlated? Uh, well, no, I don't think that that's true. I think that, that so that's, that's a good question. Let me give a little, a little uh, not, not too long-winded answer, but a somewhat long answer. So it is the case that, that crime in the United States is at, are at, or crime rates are at historic lows, right? That, that if, you, if you look at a, at a time series of U.S. crime, serious violent, serious property crime, started to rise around 1960, okay, um, s plateaued around 1970, okay, from 70 to 80, they're declining, crack epidemic hits in 1985, and you see a spike in violent crime, right, although property crime is diminishing through the whole thing, and then after the peak in 1991, we have this precipitous decline in crime. Okay, in uh, in the state to the point now where our murder rate is what it was in the low nine in in the 1960s. It's really really very low. And a lot of cities. The interesting thing about that is that that benefit is actually quite progressively distributed. Right. So the decline in crime was the most in poor cities, in poor neighborhoods, and so on and so forth. The same places where essentially people are also more most likely to end up in prison. And the question becomes: So what what sort of explains that decline in crime? It's definitely the case that if our incarceration, if we were to let everybody out of prison, we would have a higher crime rate, right? That there's, there's no arguing that, okay? That, that the average effect of putting people away is, is positive and perhaps large, okay? However, that doesn't necessarily mean that the marginal effect is that large, and that's what, that's what makes California so interesting. So in California, we reversed the incarceration rate to what it was in 1992 when the California's crime rate was at its peak, okay, like the rest of the nation, okay. Reversing the crime rate, the incarceration rate in 1992, four years ago, we still have the low crime rates of 2013, 2014. So in that essence, what it's suggesting is, yes, if we let everybody out, okay, we'll be in Italy territory, okay, but that doesn't mean that the people on the margin Right, if it's done selectively and it's done carefully, necessarily can contribute to crime. Now, there's, there's an enormous literature on trying to understand what explains that crime decline. I'm just going to run you through some of the explanations, some of the, some of the crazier ones, and, and uh, not crazy, but the more provocative ones, and some that I think more people think are, are perhaps more important. Okay? Central is going to be higher incarceration, right? That probably explains some of it. Okay? Certainly in the 1980s and, and in the 1990s, maybe 10% of the decline. There are people who argue that the expansion of the um, of the of policing in the United States with the 1994 crime bill, which is actually quite central because Hillary Clinton's catching a lot of heat for support for the 1994 crime bill. But one of the things that that bill did is actually provided grants to localities to hire more cops. And there's quite robust empirical evidence that putting another cop on the street lowers crime via general deterrence and is actually more effective on a per cost basis than prison. That's one story. And then there are other stories that, that I like to call cohort-based stories, which is that the kids being born today are less crazy than the kids were being born in the past. Okay? And there, there are several stories that go behind this. So there's the lead paint theory, right? And the lead paint theory, lead paint and lead and gasoline theory is the following. So your IQ is four or five points higher than my IQ, right? Because I grew up in a time when there was still lead and gasoline and lead paint and I was eating that dirt and paint and so I'm just dumber than you guys, right? And for that reason, I'm more likely to commit crime. Okay, that's, that's sort of the story. And what, what, if you look at it, at it, and there's actually, while not strong, robust empirical evidence, it's actually a pattern that kind of fits the data in provocatively closely, right? That you see as the, as the auto and the use of lead and paint expands in the 40s and 50s, there's a lag effect when homicide starts to increase in the 60s and 70s, and then the, the, the lead is removed from gasoline and abated from paint, and you start to see reductions in, uh, you start to see reductions in violent crime. And the argument is that the younger cohort is just less criminally prone because they didn't have that particular deficit. And what's interesting, if we think about just what recently happened in Flint, right, 
where you had all of those children exposed to so much lead okay, because of what happened to their water system, you know, for criminologists who see, well, first of all, for health researchers and education people who see that, they know what the effect of lead is on, on people, right? It's, it's a sort of highly toxic and can have long-term permanent, uh, permanent uh, damage and limitation on, on one's life. But from the, from the criminolo criminological perspective, that's sort of an alarming thing to happen to a city, to have all of the children uh, end up with lead poisoning. That's another story. And then there's the abortion story, right, that was made, uh, that was made popular or was written, and, and there's some research, although it's not conclusive by, uh, by Steve Levitt, that argues that the legalization of abortion in 1978 with the passage of Roe v. Wade led to the selective uh, uh, um, sort of pre prevention of births of children who would be unwanted and who would be more likely to, to engage in crime 18 years later. And so there's a, there's a debate among economists and sociologists as to whether or not the timing of the decline lines up with the, the sort of legalization of abortion in the United States. What do I think? Right, I, my guess would be that it's a mix, more cops, more prison. I find the lead paint story to be uh, particularly um, intriguing, although not necessarily nailed down uh, with any sort of hard, hard proof, okay? Um, but there's also a little bit of, I'm a little bit agnostic for the following reason. There's this very interesting pattern that we also see in crime, which is that not only were there large declines in crime in the United States, there are also large declines in Canada, okay, that kind of mirror our decline. Actually, they had a peak in the early 90s and, and declined precipitously from uh, through to the present. They didn't have a massive increase in, in incarceration. They didn't expand their police force. I don't know when they legalized abortion, right? Or I don't know what the lead paint situation is. You also see the same pattern in Northern Europe, right? So you kind of see in England, uh, in France, that there were, there were peaks in the early 90s of decline. And in fact, if you even go longer back in time, there's a, there's a historian, a criminological historian, okay, you don't hear that word too often, who argues that if we, if we go back to like the 1000 BC, that the, the last millennium has, has sort of, there's been a continuous trend of declining violence, right? That we're just less prone to kind of murdering and clubbing one another now than we were a thousand years ago. And the, the sort of 60s to the 90s appear to be a, an aberration from that trend. And what his argument is, and you know, it's based on, on you know, sort of a few data points from medieval Europe a thousand years ago, but the argument is that essentially we're, retur we're returning to a long-term trend. So I, I, you know, I don't know. I, you know I, I have, there are these theories, there's evidence. Some have better evidence than others. Um, uh, but it, it's sort of a provocative uh, and, and fertile area of research and debate.